Hello, Mawane Weak. Hello, and welcome back, everybody, to day two of the Shifting Season Summit. We had a great lineup of speakers yesterday with a lot of amazing conversations, and we hope to continue that with the, with the momentum today. For those of you just joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Tom Canote Jr., and I am Menominee and Anishinaabe. I currently serve as the Geoscience Project Director for the College of Menominee Nation. Today, we will be starting with a presentation from our day two keynote speaker, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, follow, followed by two different breakout session blocks, and then adjoining at 2 p.m. Central Time. So just some housekeeping items real quick. Um, similar to yesterday, we would like to remind you that this session is live recorded and that all attendees are muted during this section of the summit. All the sessions yesterday were recorded and those recordings as well as those today and tomorrow will be available 24 hours after the sessions begin in case you weren't able to make it. If you have any questions for us or the keynote speaker, we ask that you use the chat box as we have folks monitoring that. Thank you. And now on to our keynote speaker. Dr. Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, and Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. She lives in Syracuse, New York, where she is the SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center of for Native Peoples and the Environment. So without further ado, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Miigwech for that, Tom. Bonjour, Jayak, Mano, Waban. Good morning, hello, everybody. I am uh, so grateful to be with you and uh, a special hello to my, my friends and relatives at College of, of Menominee Nation. I'm glad to, to be with you, even if it's in, in this remote um, uh, format. I'm going to um, share some slides. So let me get those up here for us. So, you know, we spent so much time indoors staring at screens. I want to, to bring our, our relatives in with us. There they are. Um, in our traditional protocols, we always begin with gratitude. And so as we bring to mind all of these relatives who are around us, uh, let's remember that when we first put our feet on Shkakmikwe this morning, we had everything that we need. The drink of water, uh, good food to eat, beautiful breath of spring air, the companionship of one another, of our more than human relatives, the pines and the crows who um, are, are around us, and um, the, uh, the presence of, of, of our teachers and our ancestors who have guided us uh, to this place. You know, Oops, it's not advancing. Let's see, there we go. Okay, good. Um, much of the society that we live in calls all of these relatives. Um, they don't call them relatives, right? Um, they think of them as natural resources and, but they are of course everyday miracles. Um, in ecological sciences, we call them ecosystem services as if they were somehow this inevitable outcome of, of an ecological machine. But of course, within indigenous cultures, um, 
we think about filling our basket with berries, they feel like gifts, not natural resources, but gifts from the other beings who are around us. And although every one of us lives in a world made out of gifts, we find ourselves harnessed to an economy and to institutions that relentlessly ask, what more can we take from the earth? When in fact, the orientation, the question that we need is, what does the earth ask of, of us? And it is that thinking in a time of shifting seasons, in a time of climate urgency that brings us together. And I'm so grateful to the organizers um, of, of this conference who have used their leadership and, and, and their gifts to, to bring us all together for these important conversations. I'm really honored to uh, be here with you and to um, uh, share keynote responsibilities with, with Dan Wildcat and Basile Panic as, as, as well. Thank you for, for your words. I would like to this morning especially invoke the work and the wisdom of, of Indigenous women. We know that we are in an era when women's voices and the voices of marginalized peoples all over the world are rising and will lead the way to this just transition in the face of, of climate chaos. I'd also like to invoke the teachings of our mythic first woman with gratitude and reciprocity for the teachings of Gish Kokwe, of, of, of Sky Woman. Sky Woman was adopted as the logo for our Center for Native Peoples in the Environment with the permission of the artist Bruce King who made this, this beautiful painting. And in this space, just as here at Shifting Seasons, our real goal is to care, to invoke the care for, for Mother Earth and bringing the gifts to Mother Earth of, of, of Sky Woman. And at the Center for Native Peoples in the Environment, our real mission is to bring together the gifts of Indigenous wisdom, practice, philosophy, indigenous science, and the tools of, of Western science so that we might better care for, for Mother Earth. It seems to me that for the past couple of centuries, which is really, as we know, just an eye blink of time in the lifetime of our species, as a society, mainstream culture has been doing an unintended experiment, but that has very tangible manifestations. We have unwittingly asked of ourselves and of the earth, what would happen if we believed in this pyramid of human exceptionalism? If we believed that there was a single species out of the millions who inhabit the planet that was somehow more deserving of the richness of the earth than any other. And not only that, in this unintentional experiment, all the ecological natural laws that constrain growth and consumption, they just don't apply to this species at the top of the fictional hierarchy. It's as if the laws of thermodynamics had been repealed just on, on our behalf. The experiment tests the hypothesis of what would happen if we behaved as if the earth was nothing more than stuff, not gifts, but commodities, a strictly materialist utilitarian view of the earth. And moreover, that all of that stuff belonged to us. And we know that the results of that experiment are in. We find ourselves teetering at the edge of the precipice of climate chaos, which is what brings us together entering what evolutionary biologists have called the age of the sixth extinction, in which we are losing 200 species every single day. What does the earth ask of us? The earth asks us to change. And yet so much of our environmental discourse is all about 
technology. It's all about changing light bulbs in a sense. And um, don't get me wrong, new technologies will be an important response in climate uh, catastrophe in, in allaying the, those impacts. But as a scientist, I don't think it's only new technology that we need. If we are to survive, and if our more than human relatives are to survive with us as well, we need to change a lot more than light bulbs. We need a change in world view. A change in thinking from a worldview that thinks about land as property, land as property rights in particular, as capital, as natural resources and, and ecosystem services, to the notion, a worldview of the land as home. The land as the source of our identity, land certainly as our sustainer, land as the residence not only for us, but for all of our relatives, land as our connection to our ancestors, the ones who forged the path that we walk on today, and the recognition that we are creating the path to the future for, for our descendants. It all meets, of course, on the land. Land as our library, full of our teachers, a source of knowledge, land as our pharmacy, land as healer, both uh, physically and, and, and spiritually, land as inspirited, land as home, land not as a place for which we claim property rights, but the place where we enact our moral responsibility to all of, of creation, land as, as sacred. I think in the contrast of these worldviews, mainstream societies living in an era, an era of profound error. And because for much of human's time on, on the planet before this great delusion of human exceptionalism, we know that we lived in cultures that understood ourselves not as controllers, as masters of the universe, but as the younger brothers of, of creation. And that Western worldview that has so dominated our landscape like a monoculture for the past 500 years has yielded tremendous gains in the quality of human life without question. It's brought huge advances in knowledge, but it's not more knowledge that we need at this moment. It's, it's wisdom. And generating wisdom is simply not within the purview of Western science alone. We need a science that draws upon mind, body, emotion, and spirit. We need indigenous science. We need traditional ecological knowledge, which is based on the recognition that we humans are not atop this pyramid of life, but are members of a democracy of species governed by laws of interdependence. You know that the time that we live in of great change and powerful choices has been spoken of by our ancestors in the teachings of the prophecies of the people of the seventh fire. A long story, an important one known to many of us. So I will share just a tiny fragment of it this morning to frame our thinking. It's the history of the migration of our Anishinaabe people where each fire is an era in our, in our history, both it is a story of both tragedy and courageous resilience. And then after the arrival of the newcomers and all the losses arising from colonialism, from attempted cultural genocide, the loss of land, of language, of sacred ways of each other, it's said that the people will find themselves in a time where you can no longer dip a cup into the river and and drink, when the air will become too thick to breathe, and even our plant and animal relatives will begin to turn their faces away from us. And it's said that in that time, we will know it as the time of the seventh fire. And in this time, all the world's peoples will stand at a fork in the, in the path. 
<clears throat> excuse me, in my imagination, this path, one of the paths is soft and, and green and almost shining with dew. And you could walk barefoot there. And one of the paths is black and burnt, made out of cinders that would cut your feet. And the prophecy tells us that we have to make a choice between the path of materialism and greed that will destroy the earth, or the spiritual path of, of care and compassion, of bamadziwin, of the good life. And we know what, what we want, but the prophecy tells us that we can't just go bounding down that, that green path, not to walk forward, but to turn around and walk backwards and pick up what was left for us along the ancestors' path, that path of, of, of loss. They left for us the stories, the teachings, the songs, our relatives, the plants and animals that were lost along the way, and our language. Only when we have found these once again and placed them in, in our bundles, the things that will heal us, can we walk forward on that green path? And these are the questions that has us standing today at that fork, at that crossroads. What do we find along the ancestor path that will heal us and bring us back to balance? In the time of climate urgency, I find myself asking, what do we love too much to lose? What will we carry through the narrows of climate change carefully to the other side? Because there is another side. The prophecy teaches us that the people of the seventh fire who will need great courage and creativity and wisdom will lead us to the lighting of the eighth fire. And it's said that, as you know, that we are the people of, of the seventh fire. It's said that you and I are the ones who will participate in the transformation. And one of the things that we pick up along the ancestors' path are our teachings. And faced with the problems that, that we have created, not only for ourselves, but for the, for the whole planet, I don't know about you, but I long for a teacher, for, for an elder, for a wise grandmother who could guide us in this perilous time to find that good path. And it's said that when Sky Woman went back to the sky and looks over all of us with the face of, of Grandmother Moon, that she is that teacher. And I think that she left our teachers here with us the ones she brought to us in her hand from the tree of life. She brought us the teachers, the plants. And as we know, in, in most of our traditions, plants are understood not only as persons, but as among our oldest teachers. And after all, they've been here longer than anyone else. Who better to look for for guidance than those who can take light and air and water and turn it into food and medicine? and give it away. Their numbers include the oldest, the largest, the most powerful of our relatives. We might do well to look to them for guidance in these perilous times. And whenever I'm wrestling with a question, which is pretty often, I often go to the plants for, for counsel to see what they have to say about it. And what if you were a teacher? a keeper of that great knowledge, but you had no voice to speak it and no pen to write it, and yet there was something that you needed to say. Plants tell their stories not by what they say, but by what they do. And the name for plants in Anishinaabe Moen reminds us of this. The plants who are collectively known as Mashkakin, the medicines, which means literally the strength of the earth. And in this year, which is the warmest ever recorded, when the glaciers are melting and storms are rising and hundreds of our fellow species are in grave danger, it's important to remember that we don't have to innovate our way out of this dilemma alone. We have our teachers, our plant teachers. In the indigenous 
knowledge paradigm. Knowledge arises from multiple sources. One of the hallmarks is learning from intelligences other than our own, our plant and animal relatives, the wisdom of, of the land. And this is grounded in the understanding of the personhood of, of all beings and the intelligence, inherent intelligence of the natural world. And forward thinking scientists have created this so-called new parallel area of study based on accessing the um, intelligence of nature for design, for engineering, and for environmental problem solving. And this new discipline of, of biomimicry, the notion that we can learn and model our ways after the living world, um, predictably, the science of biomimicry has been largely restricted to learning what new products might be made. Um, but what interests me is what they might teach us about how we might live. And I know in the, in the next hour, you will have the privilege of hearing from my friend, uh, Jeff Greeno, a wonderful plant knowledge keeper. And I always think of his words that the elder plants carry the knowledge that we need to survive. And if plants are our teachers in this time of crisis, what can they teach us about responses to climate change? If we were willing to listen and to learn from them. Plants know what to do about climate change. They don't dither in ineffectual meetings and debate carbon tax structures. They just get to work. They can be a model for the transformation that we need. And think about it, they have already converted completely to a solar economy. You have probably heard that entrepreneur Richard Branson has established the Virgin Earth Challenge to spur the design of new technology that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and store it while we are transforming to a fossil fuel free economy. It's a lofty goal. Critical deployment of human creativity on behalf of the climate. And the prize is $25 million. And of course, human ingenuity can certainly be a part of climate solutions. It already is. But we should also bear in mind that there is already a system that pulls carbon from the atmosphere and stores it for centuries. And it has even more bells and whistles. It, cap it too, in addition to carbon capture, generates oxygen, builds soil, protects biodiversity, purifies water, and it makes us feel happy and peaceful and at home. It's called a forest. I say, give the Branson Prize to the trees because trees don't put CO2 into the atmosphere. They take it out and sequester it in long-term storage in the bodies of tree trunks, in 12 foot deep roots of prairie grasses, in the deep bogs of peat, in the organic matter of rich fertile soils. After all, what are coal and oil but the stored carbon of prehistoric plants? The plants stored away all of that carbon, kept it out of the atmosphere until we decided to rip open the earth and burn eons of stored fossil carbon in just a few centuries. Plants have been sequestering carbon since the beginning, removing it from the air and putting it into the ground. Let's follow their lead and join the movement to keep it in the ground. What do plants do when the climate changes? They can grow faster when there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through the so-called carbon dioxide fertilization effect. But hard as they might try, as the plants grow full tilt with extra carbon, they soon run out of other things, other limiting factors come into play, like nutrients and water and soil with predictable consequences. The plants don't degrade soil, they build it. Plants don't degrade water, they purify it. And when we stand in a shower of spring rain, we have the plants to thank for that. 
cut down enough forest and the rain disappears. Plants save the water. As the world heats up, who is it that creates oases of shade? Who cools our cities, her urban heat islands? But the trees, doing sophisticated air conditioning without using a single watt of electricity. They don't ruin the land, they heal it. They are our teachers of resilience and restoration. Animals respond to climate change too, by moving, if, if they can, to more favorable climates, if they still exist. But the plants can't do that. It takes so much longer for rooted beings to move, so they adapt. And under conditions of stress, many plants accelerate sexual reproduction. They mix up their genes. They make lots of seeds of many kinds. And plants are in a way the anti-Monsanto. They create and harbor genetic diversity instead of diminishing it, especially in partnership with native farmers. All of this is to remind us that the climate solutions that exist in nature's inherent capacity for regulating the climate. And when we imagine and act and advocate for climate solutions, let us also think about these nature-based, what are called the nature positive uh, climate solutions to halt deforestation, to accelerate afforestation, ecological restoration, wetland protection that are just storehouses of carbon and biodiversity, regenerative agriculture, biodiversity uh, protection, all of these nature positive solutions are part of climate mitigation and resilience as well. And yet when you look at the emerging budgets and effort for um, uh, climate change mitigation, only 8% of all of the funding goes towards these nature-based solutions. And I think some of our work is to, um, is to protect nature's inherent capacity to, to address the climate change, especially on tribal lands and on all of our lands. If the plants are doing this healing work, what we have seen in the carbon budget models is that we are already past the point where we can rely entirely on nature positive forest solutions to reestablish CO2 balance, even if we protect and invigorate them. We've simply added way too much carbon to the atmosphere and cut down too, too many forests so that in the short term, we've crippled the planet's ability to respond. The plants can't do this alone. We have to help them. And when I think about the ways that the work of this powerful group can support the plants in doing this healing work of carbon sequestration and biodiversity practice, protection. We think about the ways that traditional tending practices aid productivity and, and biodiversity. Can we think about our lands as ways of creating connectivity corridors so that the plants and animals can move? You know, our people have always been agents of assisted migration, of moving plants around so that they are with us. Can we reinvigorate the practices of assisted migration, of essentially helping forests walk? Um, this will take knowledge sharing. It will take protection of indigenous lands and expansion of indigenous lands um, to do this, this, this work. It really will take uh, putting our hands in the earth to heal our plants and our soil so the plants can, can heal us in return. And particularly now with Secretary Deb Howland in stewarding all of the so-called public lands of the United States, we have to remind the general public that every single acre of public land is indigenous land, right? And so instead of, <coughs> sorry, instead of public lands adding to the climate burden through fossil fuel production, public land 
guided by indigenous wisdom can become part of the solution in these nature-based uh, practices. We have to realize that in terms of conservation, it's not enough anymore to only protect the remnants that we have left of the living world. We have to heal the wounds that we have caused. We have to both stop the degradation and to fix it. And so how do we support the plants in their healing work? Through restoration. And this has to be an imperative to work with our gifts as human people, with all of our, 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 our tools to, to heal the land through restoration. And indeed, ecosystem restoration is a powerful force for uh, justice for the land to engage our plant relatives and teachers in this work. But we also have to remember that it's not the land that's broken. It's our relationship to land that has been broken. And so using our gifts of, of traditional knowledge, of indigenous science, of the teachings that we pick up along that ancestor's path on our way toward the eighth fire, that we need all of our teachings to heal relationship to land, to that change in worldview. And my friend Gary Nabhan uses this wonderful term of that restoration has to include restoriation, a chance to shift our worldview, to tell a different story about relationship to land, the story that is held in our ancestral teachings of, of traditional knowledge. Based on values based on what we often think about, right, as the five R's, there's really so many more than five, but to, to think about guiding all of our work and our policy with respect, relationship, responsibility, reciprocity, and reverence. That's how we change the story, by, by sharing the wisdom of the indigenous worldview to guide our healing in a time of climate change. And yes, plants are part of the solution. Um, yes, individuals are part of the solution with our small acts of reducing carbon footprint. But we also have to recognize that what an individual can do is a small fraction of the carbon emissions from institutions, from industry, who are fed by federally subsidized reliance on, on fossil fuels. They're fed on an by an economy that incentivizes destruction for private gain over the common good. And it is time to imagine and to implement a, a new green economy for the future. We need system change to combat climate change at a large scale. This too is part of restoration. But while we do that, heading down the green path, let's remember the teachings of the seventh fire prophecy that we turn around and pick up what was left for us by our ancestors so that we can go in a good way down that green path. And I think we could do worse than engage with the philosophy of learning from the plants. And if plants are our teachers, we have to ask ourselves, how do we be better students? What more do we have to learn with Ed Besenduin, with the humility to listen and learn from our, our plant relatives? What does the earth ask of us? How do we learn and be better students of our plants? Um, we show respect. A key piece of our ways of knowing and being and a way of showing respect to the living world is for that respect for the personhood of, of all beings, which is so inherent in, in our cultures, to recognize relatives, not resources. And if we engage in our teachings regarding all living beings as, as persons, we can follow the lead of our Maori relatives and who have worked to have their sacred river, the Wanganui, declared a person or to the indigenous led nations of Ecuador and Bolivia, 
who have enshrined the rights of nature in their constitutions, to the global movement, again, led by indigenous leaders, by indigenous philosophy, which is manifest in the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Nature, which is currently before the United Nation. Another way that we show respect and the way that we can be inspired by indigenous wisdom, knowledge and practice is thinking about the role of our indigenous languages that, that they play in, in healing for, for the earth. Recognition of personhood takes place not just in international tribunals, right? But in our everyday speech. And most of us speak on a daily basis English. And it's so exciting to see the way in which our languages are being revitalized as to, to balance that, to um, give us the opportunity to once again be students and speakers of our languages for their inherent beauty, their legacy, and for the teachings and the respect that they show to the living world. And to my mind, one of the many aspects of linguistic imperialism that has um, plagued this nation from the early days when, those first, when the colonists first came here is this little word right here, this word it. Because when we speak English, we refer to our families and one another as, as persons, right? But when we talk about strawberries or, or bears or salamanders or butterflies or opichi, we, we call them, them it. Um, and would we ever say of, of our beloved grandmother, oh, it's making a cup of tea. Of course we wouldn't. Um, it robs her of her personhood. It makes her nothing more than an object. It's deeply disrespectful, right? To call one of our relatives and, and it, it robs one of personhood and, and, and kinship. But in the English language, a being is either a person or a thing. We are given no way in English to refer to our more than human relatives other than it. And this objectification of nature opens the door to the exploitative economies and worldview that we, that we live in that threatens us in a time of uh, climate change. And linguistics um, really code our relationship to the living world. They kind of set the boundaries of, of who is within our circle of respect and, and, and compassion. And when a maple tree is called an it, we can take up the chainsaw very easily. And when maple tree is a her, we, we have to um, at least think twice. But as we know, in our indigenous languages, there is no it for birds and, and, and for berries or for grandmother earth. Our languages are uh, based on the grammar of animacy applied to everyone who lives, to sturgeon, to mayflies, to, to blueberries, to boulders, to rivers, to, to geese. We refer to other members of the living world with the same grammar that we use for our family because they're our family. And if we are to survive here, and if our plant and animal relatives are to survive here, mainstream society needs to learn to understand the grammar of animacy. As we reclaim our languages, we also reclaim and teach and model a respectful relationship with the earth. And I think we need to um, honor the fact that learning our indigenous languages, revitalizing our languages is also an antidote to, to climate change and, and healing for the earth. You stuck here? No, there we go. Among the teachings of, oops, sorry, where was I here? All right. So what I wanted to think about together next 
is how can we choose reciprocity? How can we choose to invest in the, the teachings of the plants? And when we're among them, when we are listening and, and learning what they have to teach us, I think about these amazing plant teachers who are so brilliant, who are gentle and wise and creative beyond our possible knowing, intelligent, sacred beings who give and give. They are trying to help. They're doing their best to save the world against human folly. It feels sometimes like our plant relatives are trying to hold everything together until the industrial society grows out of this destructive adolescence and, and grows into wisdom. The plants are making forests, they're making these deep dark soils, they're making food and medicine, home for all beings and trying to hold back climate change. They are trying so hard to save the world, and they do it. But instead of showering them with gratitude and respect that they are owed, we cut them down, dig them up, enslave them, poison them in an act of betrayal which is so profound, it threatens the very continuity of life. What do you suppose it will be like at the moment when people wake up and realize that they have ground our oldest teachers underfoot. I'm going to wind up with a story. It's a story that I return to again and again for hope and courage in a time of crisis. And let me tell you that I first heard this story from Haudenosaunee elder and friend Tom Porter, sitting at his table at Ganajo Halege, where he pulled out a deerskin bag full of the stones. When he told me about the time when Sky Woman's grandsons, the twins, were in conflict over the future of the beautiful world about how the struggle between the twin forces of creation and destruction, which are always with us, were at last to be decided in a game. And I asked Tom whether I might incorporate this story into the teachings that I share. And he very generously, generously agreed. It's a powerful story for the moment that we live in. These two boys, um, Flint and Sapling, were the twin sons of, of Sky Woman, who we invoked at the beginning of, of this talk. And from the very beginning, these boys were very different from one another. It's said that Sapling went around making the world um, whole and, and beautiful and easy for the human relatives that would, would follow him. Um, he, he made berry bushes. And then his brother Flint came along and said, mm, too easy, and put thorns on those bushes. It was Sapling who made the rivers run both ways in order that we'd always have an easy paddle. And then Flint came along and made them work one way. So we'd have to work hard to, to get home. You see how it goes. The brothers were in constant uh, competition for what the world would be like, an easy path for people or, or a very hard path. And eventually out of this competition, they decided that they would match their skills in the peach stone game to decide the, the future of, of the earth and whether it would be a world with uh, thorns on the berry bushes or whether it would be a place of generosity and continuity. Indeed, whether the world would exist at all, these forces of creation and destruction. 
And so the players, as you probably know, use a, a set of so-called stones. They might be peach pits um, or other kinds of, of, of seeds painted on one side black and on the other side uh, white. And the player shakes the bowl, tosses the stones into the air, and only when all of the stones have turned one way or the other would a winner be declared and the fate of life on earth would be decided. If all of the stones came up black, then flint would prevail and destruction would be loosed upon the world. Should they all fall white, then the world would continue under the generous hand of creation. And the boys set themselves to play for one entire day. They played and they played without a winner. They tossed the seeds for hours back and forth and back and forth. And with every throw, two boys gambled with the future of the world. Would life continue as we know it or would all be lost? It's such an ancient story and yet could not feel more contemporary as we are today gambling with the future of the earth, with the continuity of life on this beautiful planet. On and on Flint and Sapling played into the night, all night, until the glimmer of light at the eastern horizon warned them that time was nearly up. They could make only one more throw as the pink of dawn began to color their faces. The stones flew into the air for the last time and they began to clatter one by one into the bowl. The first one came up black and the next and the next. All the stones were black until there was only a single seed still hanging in the air, tumbling and spinning on its way to the bowl to join the others. All of our relatives, all of the other beings watched in terror as humans gambled with the continuity of life. And at the moment when all life hung in the balance, it is said that all the members of creation, the trees, the berries, the grasses, the birds, the four-legged, the many-legged, the no-legged, they all drew in their breaths as the last stone tumbled. And together, all creation gave a mighty shout. Its forces caused the human foolishness to be overruled. And the power of their collective voices turned that last stone over as it fell into the dish. The color of trillium blooming in the spring. The color of mother's milk, of moonlit snow. The color of polar bears. I've tried to imagine the sound of that shout, the roars, the panting, the swishing of grasses. And in my imagination, I feel rather than hear their voices large and small, chirps, hoots, buzzes, howls and flutters, scrapes, squeaks, leaf flutters, needle whispers, spine quivers, buds swelling, seeds bursting, roots pushing, spores popping, and the vibration of the membrane in the smallest microbe coalesced in a great wailing wind so cohesive in its strength and direction that it stops the stone, spins it around, holds it in poised in midair, and then sets it down, life side up. It was the mighty shout of creation that saved the beautiful world, not the people. But we are gambling again with the fate of the earth. The plants, the birds, the salamanders and starfish, 
They're all trying to make that mighty shout, but we have weakened them to the point that their voices are threadbare and faint. A raspy whisper that can barely be heard over the roar of bulldozers. All this time, they have stood for us and we have paid them with betrayal, with silence as destruction reigns. And now it's we humans who have to give that mighty shout. I've tried to imagine what it would sound like to offer my own mighty primal shout for life. As a scientist and as a writer of the earth, I imagined that it would be like a, a hallelujah chorus or something. But to my dismay, what arises from my throat is a wail of anguish at the realization of what we have done. It's a great cry of shame and a howl of grief for the creation. And it surprised me and it scared me that my shout was a raging no and not a yes of encouragement to the rest of creation. And it scared me at first, but there was wisdom there in understanding that grief is the measure of the depth of love and it's love that's the material of transformation. Feeling the wounds of the world propels us and in this time, in order to shout yes to creation, we have also to say no to destruction and resist, resist, resist on behalf of the good green world. And then out of the powerful love that we have for the world, raise our voices in a song that will save us. The other beings are waiting to join us in that mighty shout. We remember that the plants have not succumbed to despair. They're growing on mine waste. They're healing land and they are storing carbon and holding biodiversity. They make food, they make medicine, they make beauty. They give more than they take. They heal the people and heal the earth. They are our teachers. Surely we can do the same. Ambe, Mashtada. Come on, let's get started. Miguel, Miguetch, thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Kimmer. Um, now we'll have uh, questions from the audience. Um, we'll give folks time to uh, enter their questions in the chat, um, but I think we have a few just to get the ball rolling. Um, so, so here's one. Um, how do we get the general public to recognize beings, not as it's? Um, specifically, I guess, general public, maybe more so um, non-native folks and, you know, Western scientists that we, we work shoulder to shoulder with um, in climate change adaptation. Yeah. Well, I think that the power of the rights of nature movement can be an ally in this work because it provides an intellectual framework in which to house these ideas of, of, of personhood, right? That's at a, at a pretty large level. But when working with our colleagues, and I find this all the time teaching in a, in a, in a, a hyper-scientific environmental institution, um, that this idea that is so common to us as Native people is, is, has been in a way squeezed out of, of in science education. It's like we're, we're told we can't possibly do that. You know, this, this notion that we're not allowed to personify nature because it would be anthropomorphizing. What I try to say is, no, we're not anthropomorphizing. We're not trying to say that, that plants and, and, and bears and, and mushrooms are people. 
we're, we're not saying that are human people, we're saying that they're their own kind of person, um, that they have their own gifts, their own responsibilities in the world, their own intelligences, and, and engaging in with my colleagues in that way. Um, for the most part, they say, well, yeah, um, we, because when you get to that realm of, of using emotional intelligence, using our spiritual knowledge, it becomes, we remember. We remember what we always knew before we were taught that the living world is made of stuff and not of people. Um, so it's just in making relationship and asking people, you know, how they, um, how did they relate to the, to the living world before they became a scientist? You know, mostly, I don't know any scientists maybe I need to look harder, um, who came to science for love of data and hypothesis testing. They came to this work for love of the world um, and for love of those beings. Um, I think that's the pathway in. Awesome, thank you for that. Yeah, that, you know, I really enjoyed, um, I guess your, your uh, definition of, um, or possibly, you know, a theme that relies within TEK as far as um, learning from intelligence other than our own and recognizing that that that's um, I've, I've never heard that before and you know it's such a succinct and uh, awesome way to put it um, let's see if we have any more questions um, oh um, maybe can you expand on the um, I guess Indians or indigenous folks as being agents or always having been agents of assisted migration. Um, you know, that, that, that immediately in my mind, you know, goes back to the indigenous highways that we used to have that, um, as, as you mentioned, Jeff Greeno um, in his work with Dr. Overstreet talk about um, in reference to Menominee as far as, um, you know, these indigenous highways and trade systems that we had in place um, prior to colonization and sharing seeds um, you know, agricultural practices, things like that. So maybe can you um, expand on that as far as what does that look like today and into the future? Yeah, I would love to. Um, this, this notion, you know, of drawing upon the way that our people always help the plants move. I love those stories at, at Menominee. Here in Haudenosaunee territory, they talk a lot about some of the nut, the southern nut trees, which sort of naturally by the botanist definition wouldn't occur here but they do because people love those trees and they always carry them with them so that they would be present in their in their homelands um trading for seed seed exchanges um medicines in particular were moved around all the time so that they could be there to help the people um and this notion of, of helping forest walk is something that we always did. Historical botanists will talk about what they call cultural disjuncts. That is when they look at a map of, of distribution of plants or mostly plants, um, they'll say, what the heck is that plant doing that far north or that far south? Well, range extensions by, by people who moved them. Um, I think that today in knowledge sharing opportunities like shifting seasons like our just our indigenous science and sharing networks right have the potential to do that again um when we look at the ways in which the the southern the the southern species for example are going to have to move north they're climate refugees we, we can't just think of humans as climate refugees the plants are as well so how are we going to help them um I think we work with our, our relatives and, and nations to the south who say, your plants are going to need to, to move um, and our places might be suitable for them. We need to build a relationship with those plants. We need to help them move um, and, and, and get to know them. Um, and uh, I, I think that that is a powerful way of climate resilience and adaptation that native people can and should be leading. That's why I think about it, you know, synonymous with things like indigenous land trusts. Um, can, we, can we work together to create these corridors by which the plants and animals can move, sharing our knowledge, sharing our, 
our, our lands and indeed expanding our land strategically to be able to create those the, those corridors. It's one of the, the gifts of, of traditional science and our web of relationships to share knowledge in that way. Awesome, thank you. Well, looks like you opened the floodgates with uh, some of your responses because we have all sorts of questions coming in from the audience now. Um, this one's from Nikki Cooley. So, um, Dr. Kimmerer, did you always have such a strong voice? I ask because many of us are trying to find our voice or to speak up so we can protect our mother and father and relatives. You do it so eloquently. Nikki, miigwech for that. I say that with a heartfelt to miigwech because no, it took me a long, long time to to find my voice. You know, when I, when I was a student in particular, I felt really silent. There was no one around me who thought the way I did, who looked the way I did. And, and so I just kept very, very quiet. Um, and it was later, later in life when, you know, I think about our teachings about the gifts that we are given as human people in return for the gifts of the earth. And as somebody who has, you know, had the great privilege of spending my life on my knees learning from plants, quite literally, I thought there's plant blindness in, there, in this country. People don't, people don't appreciate the, these incredible beings who are around us in return for the privilege of having been taught by the plants, I needed to raise my voice. Um, and it was, um, it was in a sense inspired by that love, I would say of the plants, but the truth is it was the love from the plants <laughs> that, that made me know that I had to do this. And um, so um, I'm so grateful for all those forces that, that, that helped me find my voice. And, and it, it is that coupling of gift and responsibility that helps us um, raise our voices and, and bring our gifts into the world. Thank you for that question. It's very close to my heart. Awesome. Um, so we have another one from Jasmine Niash, uh, the student president here at CMN. Um, she says, uh, one of the things I found amazing in writing Sweetgrass is your story about asking students to rate their knowledge of positive interactions with humans, and they had none, despite knowing a lot about the negative consequences. How important do you think this perception of human nature interaction is, and what can we do to combat that narrative in the general science dialogue? Oh, Jasmine, that, that's the pivotal question, isn't it? That's why this notion of restoriation is so important. Um, this notion that it's, it's that very Western, thank you very much, Descartes, <laughs> um, idea about the separation of humans and nature, right? Um, and that humans and, and nature are a bad mix, that all we are is consumers. Well, there are economic forces out there who want us to think about ourselves as only consumers and only takers. So it's a powerful act of resistance to remember our traditional teachings that are full of, no, this is how you give back to the earth. You can't just take, you're always having to give back our, our, our teachings about renewal and, and that human people actually generate biodiversity with our land care, right? Um, and these ideas are starting to take hold in, in mainstream society. You see it in all of these little places that are to me really encouraging, but that's where we speak from traditional knowledge and to share and to say, no, you know, our teachings are that, that we, we are givers to, to the land. Um, and uh, that's why I always am invoking restoration because that feels like a very powerful way that we can give back to the land. Um, so is regenerative agriculture, right? Um, so is using our, our art and our, and our science um, and our votes um, on, on behalf of the land. These are, yeah, we, I think to, to spread that message that we're not powerless um, and, and to use our power. Awesome, thank you. Um, 
So we have another one from uh, Dr. Mike Dockery. Uh, he yeah. says, Chimigwich, Robin, it is really hard to follow up your beautiful words with a question. Um, but he asks, how can we change our universities, especially the 1862 land grants, so they are more fully supportive of indigenous people and are more than human relatives? Boy, Mike, thank you for that question. And that is all of us as students, as educators to do that. And I wanna make that point in particular that it is students and educators. We're all the same at this, you know, at various points um, to, to make this change. I think that when students in particular raise their voices and, and demand decolonization in, in the university, um, my experience is that that's a very powerful act. Um, the how to, oh, Mike, I want to sit down and let's lay out the agenda. <laughs> um, but part of it, of course, is, is uh, more Indigenous faculty members. Um, and I think it is indigenizing the curriculum so that we don't just perpetuate this intellectual monoculture of Western science to be able to say, you know, there are other absolutely coherent, beautiful, creative ways to see the world and interact with the world. And it should be part of every student's education to know about them. It's uh, so, you know, in, in our work at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, yes, we are training um, a new generation of indigenous scholars, but we also say, well, we're also training the bulk of natural resource managers for the, for the Northeast. How can we educate them so that they become allies to this work and not roadblocks? You know, they have to graduate knowing about treaty rights. They have to graduate knowing about traditional knowledge and indigenous models of sustainability like this, like the SDA, SDI model, right? Um, so I think tribal colleges are leading the way and, and, and the land grants um, need to um, follow. To say nothing of land grab, that, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and then one last question. Um, this one's from President Chris Caldwell. Um, he says, Poso, Dr. Kimmerer, uh, you're, you are answering as I'm typing, but can you expand on thoughts about how climate change might impact language revitalization efforts? And any further thoughts on how to use this event as a positive? I guess the first question is, um, can you expand on thoughts about how climate change might impact language revitalization efforts? Chris, that is a fascinating question. And to me, they really go hand in hand with the notion of restoration. And as we know, through our languages, we internalize again our worldview. Um, um, we, we speak in the way that we think. So I think about indigenous language revitalization as helping all of us find our voices. You know, back to that question that Nikki asked, it, you know, it just occurred to me that beginning to learn my language was also part of, of finding my voice um, because it connects you to this, in such a tangible way to ancestral knowledge and framing the world. Um, so I think that the, the, the influence, Chris, to me, it's, it's nothing but a positive influence on language revitalization in earth stewardship, um, particularly with, with, with climate change. Um, I'd have to give some more thought to how it might work the other way. Um, but at, at this point, it seems to me to be a powerful source of energy. And, oh, you know, the other thing that we've been talking about in this emerging Potawatomi Plant Protection Network is that the tools that our language warrior colleagues have been using for revitalization of, of, of language can also be turned to revitalization of plant knowledge and, and, and land knowledge. And we know that when we, when we use the language in a practical setting, on the land, naming and doing, um, that cements the language as well. Um, so there, 
I think they're definitely linked with one another. Awesome. Well, thank you for such an amazing keynote and we thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And we all learned and appreciate it very much in each time you share. Thank you, Dr. Kimmer. Miigwech. Wonderful to be with you all. Much <laughs> well. Oh. Um, so right now we will break for um, 10 minutes um, and then begin our first round of breakout sessions, um, which can be found in the agenda on Pathable. Um, Make sure you feed yourself, you know, drink something, um, grab some more coffee and water, take a bio break. Um, again, rest your eyes, look away from the screen. Um, and then also make sure if you haven't already, check out the virtual tours on the event page. Uh, sorry about that, my dogs going after the mailman, it sounds like. Um, so again, just take a break and then we will see you folks um, at the breakout sessions at 1120 Central Time.